Good morning, everyone, and welcome on this Sunday morning. I, I trust that all of you have had really a powerful week in Christ. I really pray and have prayed that this week that you've had a moment or moments where you've got to experience God's sustaining grace in new ways, in powerful ways, ways that you can share with your family and, and others that you may be in contact with over the phone or even if you're online with them. Just letting them know that God is at work in our lives, even amid this COVID-19 situation. And especially this week, because it was Thursday that the governor issued some further mitigation and implemented that uh, among all the other uh, guidelines that we have, some further ones for our county and, and for our city. It was a proclamation that's going to limit our social community, recreational leisure, and all the sporting gatherings that we have to only those within our household, our immediate family. Uh, it's requiring us when we go out to be more cautious, to make sure that we stay six feet away from the people next to us and around us uh, that are outside of our household whenever possible. This whole spread of this COVID-19 virus that we're under has continually changed our lives on a weekly basis. And for some, sometimes on a daily basis. Now we find ourselves under some further guidelines that are for our protection and for the protection of those that are around us, those that we care about, those that we love, our neighbors. We're being asked to stay in our homes except for those necessary exceptions like going to get groceries or, or medicines or for those that are an essential workforce during this time. I've been wrestling, and I don't know whether you have, but for me, it's been a wrestle with a question. I've been wondering what God wants to do during this period. While we're confining ourselves to our homes, I've been asking myself, does God want to do something in our lives that he's never done before? Uh, does he want to use these moments to increase our faith, to bring us to a deeper understanding of his truths, to, to do a new thing, a new thing that will prepare us for the future, for what's ahead? And I keep coming back to the same answer. Yes, he does. He wants to do something new, even while we're confined to our homes during this whole period of time. And so this morning, what I want us to do is I want us to go to John's gospel right, right after the resurrection, right after Mary has been to the tomb and a couple of the disciples and they found it empty. And, and after that moment that Mary stands at the tomb while everyone else leaves and she thinks it's a gardener, but it's really Jesus and Jesus is Mary and she recognizes his voice and she becomes so excited. She runs back and tells the others, I've seen the Lord, but they haven't seen him yet. They just know the tomb's empty and they're not for certain what's happened there. The scripture tells us they don't even, they're not even certain that the resurrection has taken place yet in their own minds and their own hearts. And so I want us to go to John's gospel to the 20th chapter, the verses 19 through 23, because I think that you and I are going to find out this morning that God used those moments in the disciples' lives to teach them while they were behind closed doors also. So would you listen this morning? Listen to Abby Ritchie as she shares the scripture with us. John 20, 19 through 23. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with their doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands inside. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Thank you, Abby, for reading that this morning. Uh, in John's Gospel, the 20th chapter, the verses that you just heard Abby read, I want us to look at them this morning because I think we're going to find out that as we look at these uh, these verses, we're going to find some very uh, great correlation between maybe where we're at and where the disciples were and what Jesus was teaching them. He can teach us plus more. Uh, in John chapter 20, you've, you've got the, the disciples that are all gathered together in one room. The disciples probably are more than just the 12. It's, it's other disciples that have been followers of Jesus. Now that the crucifixion has happened, the burial, everything's been going on, the tensions are rising, the leaders are, are, are really putting the fire under their guards and others to find this group 
called disciples of Jesus, uh, all of those that are gathered together in this room, uh, really, they're social distancing. Or maybe in their case, it's more like sheltering in place. All I know is that the scripture tells us, if we read it, that they are living in fear of those Jewish leaders who have been hostile towards Jesus, who all along have been trying to find a way to silence him, to, to stomp him out, and to squelch this following that he has, those people that are proclaiming him to be Messiah. They're doing everything they can, and they've done everything they can to make sure that doesn't happen. And so the disciples in this scripture are behind closed doors. They're behind closed doors because they're afraid. They're panicked. They're in terror. They don't know what's going to happen next, what they're going to face next, how it's going to affect them. They don't know who to trust, uh, what life is going to look like in the future. They're not for certain about that yet. They don't know what to do from this point forward, and they're just huddled together behind locked doors, sheltering in place or social distancing, if you would, because of the fear that they're under right now. Just like some of us, our social distancing. We're staying in our home because of the proclamation, the restrictions, because of the fear of the unknown, the fear of what may be next or what could happen or what may happen. The disciples were there for a different reason than we are, but they were, were all behind, in a sense, locked doors, wondering about what's going to be ahead. The scripture tells us that Jesus came in the midst of Wherever he had been, he leaves there, and all of a sudden, he's right there behind those locked doors. He shows up in the room with all those disciples, feared, uh, afraid, anxious uh, disciples. It's no wonder that as we read the scripture, the disciples thought it was a ghost. It's no wonder that they they looked at one another and they, they, they thinking that Jesus was a ghost. I can only imagine the intensity that their fear must have jumped up in that moment. And so Jesus, in that moment, uh, as he's among them, begins to teach them. And it's no wonder the disciples probably were a little anxious about meeting Jesus, if he had resurrected, to see him again, because they remember Friday. They remember on Friday, they didn't exactly stand beside him. Uh, not all of them were there for him. Some of them cursed him. Some of them ran away from him. Some of them denied him. And because of those actions, they weren't for certain. When Jesus met them in that room, whether or not uh, they were going to be rebuked, they were going to be censured, uh, they just weren't for certain. And so when Jesus comes among them, not only are they the fears of what could happen from the, the influences outside that room, but now Jesus is there. And they had all been wondering what's going to happen when we see him again, realizing how we reacted on Friday and how what we did on Friday. And so in the midst of that moment, Jesus comes to them and he uses the words to calm them and to calm their fears because Jesus wants to use this moment to teach them. It's a teaching encounter more than it is anything else. They just haven't realized it yet. So here are some of the things that I want us to grasp real quickly this morning that Jesus taught them. I want us to see as we look in this scripture that Jesus wanted to teach them their worth, their value in verses 19 and 20. Jesus said when he got in their midst, he said, peace be with you, a normal Hebrew greeting. But Jesus, when he says peace be with you, he isn't talking about the peace that the rest of the world is used to, a peace that's really more of a longing or a wishful hope that they have. When Jesus says peace be with you, Jesus is saying, I'm bringing that peace right now present among you. I'm going to pour that peace into your life. I'm going to calm your fears. I want to calm all the anxiety that you have. I want to put life in perspective for you. And I want you to be able to stand in the midst of life, even in the difficult moments, with a calmness and a peace that says, I'll sustain you. We'll get through this together. And so Jesus stands in the middle of them with all of their fears about meeting him, about those hostile Jewish leaders outside their doors. Jesus looks at them and says, I want to calm your fears. I want to calm your worries. I want to sustain you during this time. The disciples, because some of them still weren't for certain what was going on, Jesus looks at them in this scripture and he says, here, come, touch my side as you, as you begin to, to look through these, this scripture and read it. And, and not only here, but also in the other gospels that records the same story. Jesus has touched my side, touched my wounds. Jesus wants to clarify himself. He wants to, uh, to be among them and for them to understand that, that Jesus really is here. 
It's not a ghost. It's not a spirit. It, it isn't some other mystical illusion for them. It is Jesus alive and well, standing there among them in that room. And as he's standing in that room, he wants them to know that I came to you because you are important to me. You have value to me. No matter what you did on Friday, no matter what you said, no matter how you reacted, my love for you, my the value that I find in you is not determined on what you do. It's not determined on whether you do good or you don't do good. It's not determined upon whether or not you're perfect or you fail. It's determined upon how I view you and how I look at you and how I understand you as more than just the sum total of actions. It's about who you are and who you were created to be. A matter of fact, the Bible, if we look through the Bible, it actually, there are so many passages that talk about how God feels about our worth and our value in his eyes. You go to Genesis, and if you were to go there to chapter one, you and I'd find out that it says that we were created. We were made and formed and fashioned in his image, in the image of God. If you and I were to go to Psalms 139, you and I would find out that it says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And all the days of our life were written in God's book before we were ever born, confirming God's prior knowledge and plans for our lives. If you were to go to Jeremiah chapter 29, look in the first verse and it talks about how he knew us before we were born, how he had plans for us before we ever came from our mother's womb. You go to the New Testament, you look at Ephesians and you look at chapter one. It says that God chose his children before the very foundation of the earth. Before it was ever formed, God chose us. In the Ephesians chapter one, you go on down to verses 13 and 14. It says that we are told that we are God's possession. We are his chosen for the praise of his glory and that we have an inheritance in heaven with him as his children. And on and on, the Bible talks about this relationship that we have with God and how we've been created. God wanted the disciples to understand that their value and their worth was not in any way connected to, to what they did or, or how they reacted. Their value and their worth to the heart of God has always been there will always be there. And there's nothing in this life that can change the love that God has for them or for us. That's why the scripture in John that said, God so loved the world, us, that Jesus came. Because God's love for us isn't dependent upon all the other things that so often people look at and begin to judge their value with. Jesus wants us today to embrace our value and our worth. Not the way the world does and not the way the world thinks. Jesus knows that we as human beings draw our worth from too many unreliable sources. Uh, you and I draw our worth, for instance, from some of us from our jobs. We, we find out how valuable, valuable we are by how we work and the job that we have and the, the, the job that we do. And now in this coronavirus, this COVID-19, when so many are trying to work from home, all of a sudden their job where they find value and worth has been turned upside down and inside out. It's challenging that worth and that value. There are young people who are so used to getting their value and their worth from their peers and from Instagram and, and from television and all the advertisements telling them what they should be and how they should look and, and what really is valuable in life. And now all of a sudden, all of that has been turned upside down and inside out. Where do they get their value from when that's not there? And I could go on and on about how this world begins to look into our lives and pour into our lives these unreliable means of measuring how valuable I am or how worthy I am. God looks at all that straight in the face and he wipes it all away and he says, none of that, none of that matters. Because if you really want to know your true value, your value is not in how your job, your value is not what's on Instagram. It isn't what your friends say or your neighbors say about you. Your value is in how I view you. And my friend, when God looks at us, no matter where we're at or, or what's going on in our life, no matter what we're thinking about ourselves right now, 
God looks and said, you have value. That's the reason I came. That's the reason I want to be a part of your life. That's the reason for my love for you is because no matter what else is going on, you are loved and you have value. And when he came to the disciples, he wanted them to know. He wanted them to, to reaffirm that truth, that to learn that they have value to God, no matter what happened on Friday. This is a new day, and he's never stopped loving them. Not one moment in time, not one ounce of love has ever felt from his heart for the disciples, nor does it fall for us. Your value, my value, cannot be determined on unreliable temporary measures and sources. It has to come from the one that loves us more than anyone else does. Because that's where our true worth comes from. And then in verse 21, if you and I were to look down when it says, and again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Not only did he want them to learn they have worth, he wants them to learn and to grasp that their life has a purpose. It's bigger than themselves. I know he wanted them to be able to, to walk out of that room someday and and to go out into life and to wake up every morning saying, I know who I am and I have a purpose. I'm a partner with God in a mission that's bigger than I am. That's when Jesus says, as a father sent me, I'm sending you. This is the moment where this whole concept of sin, sending intensifies. Jesus says, absolutely, without a doubt, the father sent me. I have been here on this planet, this earth, living among you, ministering, caring, with a purpose that's a kingdom purpose, bigger than any leader, religious leader has ever really recognized about. And now I'm going back to my father. And so what I want you to understand is that purpose, that reason that for your existence that you're here is, is greater than you imagine because now I am giving you that purpose. I'm giving you that mission. I want you to be my partner here on this earth so that everything that I was doing, you'll do. So every, every ministry that I was involved in, I'll have people that are ministering it around the world to people who have yet seen me, who have yet to hear from me. It's a dominant theme in all the Gospels. It's Jesus' mission, his compassion for people. And you know, we may long for heaven, especially in these days. Uh, there are so many that say, oh, Jesus, I wish you'd come. But the truth is that the work isn't done in heaven. The work is done here on earth. This is where Jesus has left us and is sending us. And every day that you get up, every day that I get out of my bed, I want us to understand that, that we get out of our bed, we get dressed, we, we go out and do the activities that are part of us, whether it's job, school, whatever it is. We have a purpose in that. Our purpose is not school, although we've got to do well in that. And and that's a part of living and a part of growing. But our purpose is to live for Jesus. Our purpose is to live it in the hallways, live it in the classrooms, live it so the teachers see it, live it in our responses, live it so our friends see it. When I go to work in the morning, my purpose is not just to draw the paycheck, although that's important to be able to financially support family and, and to live in this day and age as a part of our society. It's just not to, to do well at my job, to advance, although doing well is important for us. It is to have a greater purpose. My purpose is, while I'm at my job, to live for Jesus, to, to be like Jesus, to sound like him, to do my work like he would do, to the best of my ability so that when my employers and the people around me look at what I do, they can notice that there's an, an enhancement, a, a, a diligence about it, a, a concern about it, a real effort put forth that's not like everyone else. It's an effort because I want to do it for the glory of Jesus. And I want others to see Jesus in me. It is about me going to work, understanding that the work is not my purpose. I do that and I enjoy it, I pray. But my purpose is so that everyone around me will see Jesus. And that's what he was telling his disciples. Your purpose your purpose is so that everyone, you'll live in a way that everyone will see who you are, who I am rather through who you are. And then if you look at verses 22 through 23, Jesus, there's this unusual portion of scripture, not unusual as much as confusing at times, 
When Jesus looks at them and he breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. And, and we all scratch our head and say, boy, I, I don't get all of that. It's because I want us to understand this morning that in those verses, Jesus has already said you have great value and worth. Jesus is already teaching them about their purpose. Now he wants to teach them about responsibility. He looks at them and Jesus wants them to become aware of this vast responsibility that he's laying on them and he wants them to embrace it. Hence, that's the reason he wants them to understand the necessity, the importance of receiving the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. That's the reason he says he breathed on them and said receive the Holy Spirit because he foreshadowed what's going to take place 50 days from that moment in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit is going to come upon them and empower them to be his witnesses throughout all the world. Jesus wants them to anticipate. He wants them to actively lay hold of the promise of God, the Holy Spirit in their lives. Disciples, they needed God's help to carry on with the purpose and the commission that he had given them. Jesus never expected them, nor is he asking them to carry on with that purpose without his help, without him being a part of that in their lives every day. And the way he does that is through his Holy Spirit. Jesus is never looking at us and asking us to take on that mission and that purpose and do it on our own strength and to do it alone. He's telling us that our responsibility is to receive and, and to accept everything he's offering us, even through his Holy Spirit, to be filled to overflowing so that it's not us at work alone, but it's God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit at work within our lives so we can fulfill the purpose and live the life he's called us to live. Those who are forgiven of their sins, those who you forgive are forgiven, those who you don't forgive are not forgiven. Uh, I want us to get a hold of that. The expression in verse 23 in the scripture, all of the expression are on the plural side. It means that it's not referring to individuals as much as it's referring to a community that's invested with the power that God wants to give them. It's not individual authority that makes a person judge, jury, and executioner. It is rather this understanding and this concept that, that says that I want to establish, Jesus says, my authority, I want to establish it within a group of people, the people I call mine the children of God, the disciples. I want that authority to be established and I want that authority to be based and held on all the sacred things that are taught in scriptures and have been taught by me. I want the church to grasp hold of that. I want them to begin to, to exercise that authority and set terms and conditions by which men can find pardon and live in freedom. I want them to do that by searching the scripture, to listening to what I've said, and taking those things that, that they've learned, that I put on their heart, that they're reading from the words that are holy and breathed by God and empowered by God, I want them to take all of that and I want them to set up a community of faith that tells men the way, that points them to me so that they can be forgiven. The forgiven and not forgiven, that's when we, the church, when we begin to to witness and to testify and to tell the truth to the world about who Jesus is being the way, the truth, and the life. It's about how men and women respond to that. If the church gives me that truth and I respond positively, there's forgiveness in that. If I reject it, there's not forgiveness in that. And so it all depends on the response of people. It's not my job to say you're forgiven, you're not forgiven. It's the church's job to be the witness to tell the truth, to set the terms, and then allow people to either accept that or deny that. That's what Jesus is talking about. It's this huge responsibility that says the world is only going to know me through you. The world is only going to be able to find pardon and freedom when you are faithful to your witness, church, when you have lifted me up so that others can see me and you're drawing people to me. I look at that and I think, wow, what a day that must have been. When Jesus gathered those, those disciples were gathered behind locked doors, fear of their lives. And Jesus comes among them and says, I don't want you to be locked up in this room for just fearing for your life. 
I want these moments to matter. I want to teach you something. And not only today, but Jesus told them to wait if we go on in Scripture, if we look at Luke's Gospel and we go on to Acts, we find out that Jesus said, I want you to tarry and wait here until you receive the promise, the Holy Spirit. I want you to take the next 50 days that are going to lead up to this moment. And I want you to to do everything that you can do to prepare and to learn and to make sure that when those 50 days come, that you're ready to receive what I offer you. So it was behind the locked doors where they're living with this uncertainty, this anxiety, this, this pure fear of what might happen next in their life that Jesus comes to them and begins to teach them some of the most important realities about the kingdom of God that they've ever learned or they've ever lived. It was during their social distancing, their shelter in place, that Jesus was able to start the final preparations for who they would be and who they would become together. Fifty days later, we read through the scripture. It's the day of Pentecost. It is the moment in Acts chapter 2 that the New Testament church was birthed and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to move out into the world and to change it forever. It was those 50 days that the disciples sought God. They, They affirmed his will for them. They prayed. They shared together. They soaked in everything that God wanted to share and teach them. It was a growing time so that they were ready when the promise, the gift of God, the Holy Spirit, was given to them. We're in the middle of a a pandemic right now in our lives. We are social distancing. It almost feels as though we're sheltering in place. We're being forced by this small virus called Corona, COVID-19, to make small adjustments to our daily lives and sometimes to make huge adjustments to our daily lives. And those adjustments are causing a gamut of emotional, physical, and spiritual hurdles for every day for us to get over or go around. But if we've got to go through this, I certainly don't want to get to the other side and not to have learned anything, not to be any wiser, not to be any stronger, not to be any healthier. I don't want to have gone through this, and the only thing that I have to say for it is that I made it. These moments can't be allowed to render us that feeble. We're going through it. I I accept that. You accept that. But how we get through it, we have a choice in. How we come out on the other side, we do have a say in that. So let's get to the other side. But let's get there stronger in our faith. Let's get there wiser because we've listened and we followed the good shepherd's voice. Let's get there empowered by the Holy Spirit. What if? What if? That's what we dedicate the next 43 days to. Because from today and 43 days on May 31st is Pentecost Sunday. What if we do similar to what the disciples did? What if we dedicate the next 43 days to learning and preparing for the new things that God has for us on the other side of the coronavirus? Because I'm convinced that God wants to teach and prepare us for what's next, a new thing. He wants to do it among us. And if I have to be, if you would, social distancing, if I have to shelter in my home, if I have to be confined by the restrictions because it's the best, I get that. But I want to make sure that while I'm there, when I get to the other side, I'm prepared and ready for what God has for us, what he has for the church, what he has for your home, what he has for you when you go back to work. What he has for you when school starts up again. Because God's got something. And I know that even in the midst of this crisis, our God is big enough to work in the midst of it. To mold us, to shape us, to teach us. So while we're behind the locked doors, let's use it. Let's ask God to teach us what he needs to teach us. So that when we get through this, we'll see that God was doing much more than just helping us survive this moment. He was using it to shape us also so that we were ready to carry on with the mission and the responsibility that he had for us. So that we're ready 
to tell the world that you have value and it's not in what everyone else says, it's in what God has said about you. Let's pray. Father, here we are amid days that we've never experienced before, dealing with proclamations and new information that we never thought we would ever see or ever have to be a part of, and yet we are. We're doing things not because it's easy, but we're doing them because it's what's best, best for our families and best for us to be those that love our neighbors as ourselves, as Christ commanded us to care enough about them that we're going to watch out for them also. We're doing all of those things, but in the midst of it, there's still anxiety, there's still fear, there's still a, a challenge to all the things that we have held uh, for some of us, we've held dear. We've held important. We thought that they were so valuable to our worth and to our being. And we're finding out that, Lord, those things are temporary. They so easily can slip away. There has to be more that defines my worth. There has to be more purpose in life than I've given to it. My life has to... My life has to... It has to be lived for something bigger than just this and for the responsibility that, that's mine to be a part of a, a community of faith, a community of faith that opens up its doors and tells the world that there's hope in Jesus and shows them who he is and what he looks like. Lord, I just pray that as we go through this, that you teach us and you use these moments to teach us that you allow us to be open and responsive and, and Lord, seeking after what it is you want for us so that when we do get through this, we have something to talk about. We have something that we can look at each other with in groups and individually and with friends and say, God did something new in my life during this time. I, I couldn't maybe see it then, but now as I look back, I see that God has been preparing me. He's been preparing my church for the moments after this virus. He's been preparing us so that we could have the impact that we have been called to have, so that we can share his love with this world. And so, Lord, I pray for every home that this won't be just a social distancing moment, that we won't shut ourselves in behind locked doors and say it's enough just to stay safe, but rather in the safety of our homes, I pray that you'll come, that Holy Spirit, you'll fall upon us that you'll get a hold of our minds and our hearts and you'll do a new work in us. You'll revive our soul. You will, you'll capture our minds. You will enlighten our hearts. And, and Lord, you will, you will cause us to be stirred with an excitement about what can be and what you want to be when all of this is passed. So teach us. Show us. Continue to... Continue to teach me and all of us about our worth and our value. Let that define us. And then, Lord, let us understand our purpose and responsibility in a way we never have before. Because, Jesus, when this is over, the church will still be alive. Christ will still be on the throne. You will not only have sustained us through this, but you will have used these moments to teach us and to mold us into deeper, greater disciples than we ever have imagined to be before. So I trust you with our lives, with our church. Lord, do something new among us in these days. Teach us, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for all that you're doing during this, this national and, and statewide emergency that we're under the way that you're making masks and you're volunteering and you're helping your neighbor and you're calling one another and you're keeping connected. And thank you for all of that because it matters. It makes a difference. My prayer is, as we continue on for these next 43 days, that we'll allow our homes and our time sequestered, if you would, away from viruses and other things around us that will use that time and allow God to use that time to shape us and mold us so that we look more like him than we ever have when we get through this. So this week, may your homes be blessed. May the Holy Spirit flood your life and may, 
May that flooding of your life with his love and grace, may it encourage you and strengthen you and help you understand you, my friend, have more value and worth in Christ than you could ever imagine because he loves you. He loves you and nothing can change that. So God bless you. Have a great week following Christ. And I'm excited to hear about what he's teaching and what he's going to be doing among us in these days ahead. Have a great week. God bless. I'll see you next Sunday.